Hi, everybody. I'm Natalie Gawkner. This is Both Sides of the Aisle. I represent the political center and have on the political right our state auditor, John Dougal. Hey, great to be with you. And on the political left, Shireen Gorbani. Hello. Hey, listeners. Thanks for tuning in. We're so excited to be on Utah Public Radio, bringing you Both Sides of the Aisle. But as excited as we are about that, it's sort of a dark time. And I use that uh, terminology reluctantly, but I think it's descriptive of what we're dealing with, uh, particularly right now in the um, Israel-Gaza war. Some would say wars and rumors of wars. Yeah, yeah. And and I want to break this down just a little bit. Uh, It looks like we're headed towards a multi-front conflict and we've got the Hezbollah chief uh, who will make a first speech on Gaza amid all this violence. Uh, We've got Iran warning of the grave consequences if Israel continues this assault. And Shireen, we even have uh, Turkey, Bahrain, Jordan, Honduras, Chile, and Colombia recalling their ambassadors from Israel. Wow. Yeah, this is an escalation, certainly. I think if we're looking at just the moves that people are making, countries are making geopolitically, um, that uh, conflation I just made is something that's been on my mind a lot as we're focusing more on this conflict and seeing more countries engage. I I just really want to reemphasize for people, if you've been listening, you know that I, um, I'm deeply anti-war and I also believe that it's really important that we separate out people from their governments, um, understanding that what is happening in a particular country is often against the will of what people would like to see happen in that country. Um, and just ask for a lot of grace and and patience with individuals uh, who are going through a lot of pain right now. Yeah. John, I mean, would you break it down any differently? I mean, do you see this threat of a multi-front conflict as being quite real? Well, I think this is one of the concerns that Israel had early on is you've got Hamas right there in the Gaza Strip, but, you know, and they were thinking it was existential, but Hezbollah on a different border and all these different if everybody surrounding them is all of a sudden concerned about Israel, it's no wonder that so many of the Israeli people think that this is about their entire existence mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And the challenge is, how do you respond? I mean, you you know, to just say, we're just going to take this vicious war and do nothing, you know, this vicious attack and do nothing. I think a lot of folks, especially, you know, if that happened to the U.S., we wouldn't say, hey, that's just acceptable, just grin and bear it. But I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with um, the nature of the impacts on on everyday um, Palestinians, and mm-hmm. it's it's how do you respond and how do you respond in the appropriate manner? John, we have uh, President Biden who's expressed uh, public support for what is termed a humanitarian pause. What what do you, how do you read that? So so I can see partly why, you know. Letting, letting folks that are in harm's way get out of the way. But then there's also the dynamic to what extent does this let Hamas um, regroup and strengthen themselves during this pause and, and maybe potentially attack during this pause. And so that's, mm-hmm. I mean, clearly there's concerns. Mm-hmm. Shireen, I, you know, I, I started out by saying that this is a, a dark start to the program. What more should we say that would... Uh, illuminate this issue for our listeners? I would just say uh, that I think it's important for people to try to develop a deeper understanding of what's happening in this region of the world. There are many excellent books, articles that are published now, um, kind of trying to help people understand and contextualize what's going on. But I think that there's also the opportunity to really listen to um, faith leaders in our communities that are trying to build bridges, that are trying to help us understand what to do. And I also encourage you to contact your federal representatives, contact your congressmen, contact your senators, let them know where you stand on this issue and what you would like to see. I think for all of us, it's really incredibly difficult to think about what is happening to the, certainly to the Israelis and and to the Palestinian people, where we're seeing just massive numbers of children, of journalists being killed, Um, wanting to see, I I would say, a greater response uh, from the United States government in that realm of humanitarian dignity and the the value of human life would be nice. Um, How we get there, I think, is complicated. Mm -hmm. John, we have in our U.S. House, uh, they've approved a $14.3 billion military aid package for Israel, but uh, the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is saying they won't even take it up. (laughs) It it frustrates me that at a dark time like this and at a time when we need uh, bipartisan consensus on things that, you know, we have this much division still. Yeah, but 
I mean, here's one of the challenges. I mean, uh, uh, Senator Schumer is coming from the perspective of we want a package deal. We want all these different things put together. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, the House is coming from the perspective of, gee, if there's support, we should be able to deal with these one at a time. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I guess I would come from the perspective, you know, at least there's something there you're dealing with. So deal with it one at a time. If that's what you can get through, I mean, it, you, you got to deal with the House, the Senate and the president all together. And so there's got to be compromises on all sides to try and deal with something. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and I think you've got uh, the American public for various reasons that are concerned to what extent are we helping others that is strengthening our security and to what extent are we going to suck ourselves into more global war mm -hmm. and stuff. And so it just as Shereen mentioned about concerns about the, the harms and, and, and the tragedy that comes with war. I think the American people are likewise after, you know, uh, the decades of war in, in the Gulf States, Afghanistan and Iraq, are we going to get sucked into something more mm -hmm. and more severe than where we're at today? Shereen, I saw a news article the other day that was titled, What Does World War III Look Like? <laughs> yeah. 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 Might look a lot like this. Yeah. Well, let's come back to sort of national and uh, just leave the the conflict, the troubling circumstances in the Middle East where they are, and come back to sort of national politics. Uh, we've well, got Natalie, before you go there, I mean, we yeah. still have Ukraine. I mean, and I alluded okay. to that, but we still got the war going on there. And, and you know, I know it's, it's not front page like it used to be, but this is still the turmoil with the Ukrainian people and Russia attacking them and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it's not just the dynamics there with Israel and the jockeying in between the House yeah. and the Senate about funding for Israel and funding for Ukraine. But, you know, we still have a war going on in Ukraine with Russia. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. And you've got the commander in chief of the Ukraine military uh, essentially saying that this five month long counteroffensive has not recaptured the territory that it needed to. And the, you hear the term uh, Shireen and John stalemate. Yeah, and I think what's um, what I'm also hearing is that there's a move to try to understand if there are opportunities for negotiation between Russia and Ukraine to understand what it would mean to draw this conflict to an end. I also saw uh, uh, Vladimir Zelensky on the Sunday shows this weekend uh, continuing to make the case for, for aid to Ukraine. I, I think it's troubling that we're not seeing that kind of support from um, Republicans in the U.S. House of Representatives, but I'm hoping that there's a resolution to make sure that we can continue to support uh, the Ukrainians and their efforts. Okay, well, so let's go to the Quinnipiac uh, poll uh, that finds uh, some interesting results, but has uh, who we refer to as RFK Jr. receiving 22% as an independent in a three-way race. That was great news to Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Shireen. Yeah, that's right. Um, so this, I think, is a really troubling poll for many reasons. But one of the things that I think is kind of important here is that really these individuals, so like Biden's... Um, Trump's support largely has not improved. Biden's support has fallen a bit, but not dramatically. But there are just some really interesting movements here. For example, an, a rise in support among black voters for Trump, which is, I think, um, concerning considering the Biden coalition that was needed to win in critical states. I also think having the name Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is doing a lot more for RFK Jr. than his politics are, which honestly are, are quite Batty, I would say, um, in, on many fronts. Mm -hmm. That's the scientific term, huh? <laughs> yeah. John, I keep telling uh, my husband that my opinion is that we haven't even begun what all the drama that's going to take place over the next, you know, 12 months. Uh, I think you're going to see people dropping out. I think you're going to see people jumping in. And I realize that the timeline is, you know, I mean, it, that now is the time. But there's some, there's some theatrics still to come, in my opinion, John. Oh, yeah, we're still a long ways out. But kind of to what Shireen was talking about, I mean, one, we've got RFK clearly jumping in this race. He's going to draw attention and, and votes from both of the candidates. I think he probably slightly harms Trump more than Biden um, from how I see the numbers. But, but to what Shireen was talking about, Trump's popularity hasn't increased, but Biden's popularity has plummeted significantly. Um, there's What I'm hearing is 70% of Democrats are very concerned about his age, think that he's too old, he shouldn't run again. Um, you've got the dynamics with the wars, which, you know, he's on the front stage, you know, you know, dealing with the wars and how to respond and people get to critique him on what he's doing well or what he's doing poorly when it comes to that. 
And, and so his, his popularity is down quite a bit. And in fact, I was seeing some polls which are showing that Trump is doing better than Biden in like five out of six of the key swing states right now by a, by a four or five, six point margin. Mm-hmm. I think he's also largely been out of the news, though. And then when people are reminded of the kind of chaos that Trump brought as president, I do think that these polls will shift. And as you mentioned, John, this is really far out. I think for us to really be um, putting a lot of credence in what we're seeing at this moment doesn't tell us what's going to happen a year from today. But it does give us a sense of a snapshot in time. And right now, things are looking bleak. Hey, Shireen, if you were to put out one name on the Democratic side for people to watch for, should a Biden fall off the wagon here? Who would you put out there? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I can tell you who I'd love to see. One uh, name. One name. Gretchen <laughs> Whitmer. I'm going with the governor of Michigan. Okay. That's interesting. John, I told my husband how much I would love a ticket that was Glenn Youngkin, the governor of Virginia, with Nikki Haley. And I don't even know who's on the top of that ticket, but I love the pairing. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and that, that's the kind of things that I but, think we could see happen. But who would you put on the Democratic side? Well, I can't come up with anyone. That's why I asked Shireen. I think I think Gavin Newsom is doing everything he can to be, quote unquote, supportive of the president and yet posturing to be right there when people say we need something else. Pick me, coach. Put me in the game. Yeah, that's and, and there's still the third party option to come out. But 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 RFK, I think, felt he was being treated unfairly by the Democratic Party. And that's why he jumped out to go independent. Yeah. As at least part of part of his justification. We need to take a quick break. John Dougal, Shereen Gorbani, and Natalie Gawkner. Stay tuned, everybody. Shereen Gorbani on the left. John Dougal on the right. Natalie Gawkner in the political center, and this is both sides of the aisle. We're going to turn local and talk about local news. And uh, John, I'm going to start with you because we're in the Republican Party with the Utah Attorney General's office. Sean Reyes just keeps making the news. Uh, new accusations surrounding his relationship with embattled anti-trafficking activist Tim Ballard. Uh, we're getting now the ideas of witness intimidation. Yeah, so uh, my understanding from uh, reading the news, uh, Davis County Attorney Troy Rawlings supposedly had received complaints about this, sounds like had investigated. There was not anything that would indicate uh, uh, that criminal charges could be filed or that criminal activity took place, something like that. And so therefore, you know, I don't know to what extent this is, you know, somebody trying to make a story out of it about something that's already been investigated, but it sounds like the Davis County attorney it already looked into it. Mm-hmm. Shereen, I'm just wondering if we'll go yet another week of both sides of the aisle where our attorney general will be on the playlist here. Yeah, it certainly feels like a disturbing trend of bad news for what I would say is for the people of Utah when our attorney general is embattled in these kinds of um, accusations. uh, Certainly the activity that happened with Tim Ballard is deeply disturbing, I think, to most of us. Um, Having that kind of close connection and those claims of corruption and sort of insider play are are just bad. It's bad for our state. And I guess I would just say, you know, as uh, statewide Republicans continue to win, do we think that there's any movement here for, you know, maybe seeing the end of Sean Reyes as our attorney Mm. general? Might he step down? Um, It's been an office that's seen a lot of uh, controversy over the years. Um, But I'm hoping that we see some better candidates stepping Mm. forward soon. Uh, John, the Attorney General's office, they've been very clear that these claims are false. They've called them defamatory, uh, unethical, uh, based on pure speculation. And I always want to be sensitive to the notion that, you know, there's always two sides of a story and, and you know, what's what's true here. But um, there's also the saying that where there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah, well, that's why I was bringing up my understanding from the news reports of uh, the Davis County attorney and what he had investigated mm-hmm. and stuff. So it was more than just he said, she said, but it was uh, reported that uh, the Davis County attorney looked into this and didn't find substantial uh, validation of these claims that would rise to any type of criminal activity mm-hmm. is, is my understanding. Yeah. Okay. So then this same uh, operation underground railroad, um, that Tim Ballard was uh, in charge of extends to LDS Apostle. Um, You know, there's been all sorts of different things involving Elder Ballard, no relation to Tim Ballard, but the most recent was the claim that uh, M. Russell Ballard shared uh, tithing records uh, with with Tim Ballard. Now, the, the LDS Church has been very clear that that did not happen, 
uh, they have expressed that they've never released tithing records to the Operation Underground Railroad or any other organization. But it's sure gotten a lot of chatter. And uh, Shireen, I don't know, what, what do you feel like you want to add to this? Well, I would just ask you how you feel. I mean, I, um, I as not a member of the faith, I don't have, uh, all I can say is I think if, if, if I were, uh, I would be taking this pretty seriously. It would make me feel pretty icky. But I don't know. What do you think about it? Well, I mean, I was pleased to see the church uh, deny it and make very clear that uh, they do not share confidential records like that. Uh, I'd, sometimes mistakes happen, but uh, but it appears to me like it's just chatter and not not truth. Uh, John, how about you? Yeah, I, I mean, my understanding is these are confidential records. You don't share the confidential records. You know, maybe somebody thought because, you know, somebody shared folks that would be supportive. They assumed where that information came from rather than, you know, here's some friends that you might want to reach out to possibly versus, hey, a better story is LDS Church shared their tithing records, which which would fly in the face of what they've talked about. When you talk about the confidentiality of the records, um, that would be very concerning if they were to share those mm-hmm. confidential records. This Davis County attorney, uh, Troy Rawlings, you know, we didn't ever hear of him until just, you know, this uh, this case came up, and now he's almost a household name. But the, the Salt Lake Tribune is reporting that they reached out to Rawlings, and uh, the comment was that when Davis County closed its investigation, there was insufficient evidence to substantiate the allegation of Elder Ballard's role with respect to LDS tithing records. So that's on the record and, and in local reporting. I, I think that's important for listeners to know. I do too. Yeah. Well, okay, so now we'll go, let's go to Salt Lake County. Uh, Mayor Jenny Wilson, uh, I know her as a shrewd administrator, a great leader, and she is tightening the belt uh, buckles, so to speak, instituting a hiring freeze and slashing travel expenses by half in what she's calling an incredibly challenging budget for 2024. Uh, at the Gardner Institute, we do actually help some with their economic forecasts, so I have a little bit of insight into what's going on there, but but she's being very proactive. John, you're a, you're a fiscal guy, a fiscal conservative guy. What do you, what do you make of uh, Mayor Wilson's leadership here? So... Um, just so folks know, uh, for county government, at the end of the year is when they adopt the budget for the upcoming year that starts in January. So this is the cycle for the mayor to be presenting to the council or for commissioners to be going over their their uh, budget and stuff like that. And so it's an interesting dynamic. Uh, clearly, I think for a lot of folks, they feel like the economy is reasonably good. So they're probably a little surprised to hear that there's a belt tightening taking place. I think part of the dynamic is um, the reports are saying some slowdown in tax revenue. Uh, one of the other things they're probably dealing with is is inflation. I know in my office alone, I'm seeing, I'm trying to compete to hire staff, and I'm seeing wages in in the market going up 10, 20, maybe even 30 percent, depending on the position. That is a sizable increase in terms of cost. Also, uh, we're all concerned about the cost of healthcare, and that seems to be, according to Salt Lake County, spiking as well in terms of the costs. Mm-hmm. And then, and then I think there was some governments who who became perhaps overly dependent on COVID cash, you know, bailout mm-hmm. money that came as a result of the pandemic that are now no longer have that money and they're having to deal with the constraints within their budget as a result. Yeah. Uh, Shireen, you've been an elected official in Salt Lake County. We need your perspective. And I, I love that John brought up what I'll call pandemic fiscal distortions because we had all this fake money out there. That and- was such a better term. <laughs> Thanks, John. Well, so I I hope that listeners understand this is, I love saying it, a county of the first class. It's the only one that we have. It's almost a $2 billion budget. And when you think about the kinds of budgets that other counties are experiencing, almost, I think it's almost a quarter of the state lives in Salt Lake County. So the amount of resources that are going in, and this is everything from when I was on the county council, I want to say it was over 80% of the budget was in the realm of public safety. So this is, uh, you know, everything from the district attorney's office, um, to legal defense, to the jails, to uh, a lot of mental and behavioral health programs that are associated with that as well. And then thinking about something like, um, I, I, you know, I do, I agree that she's a strong leader and certainly somebody who really knows her stuff when it comes to the budget. But I'm thinking about things like slashing travel expenses. My understanding is that the county council was really trying to um, expand their own travel budget over these last couple of months. So it's interesting to see that on the list. But what I'll also say is that 
getting people to conferences to connect with leaders in their field across the country often brings great innovative ideas and expertise back into our own county. So I hope that we continue to invest in county employees in a way that is meaningful, especially with the job market trends that John mentioned. We need to have good, strong, qualified professionals in these roles. And I just have to say, when I was on the county council, there would just be every year these battles between particular council members over things like $35,000 for uh, water, right? That, when you think about that in the context of a $2 billion budget, what I would suggest people should really be focusing on are transformative programs that reduce the cost to our criminal uh, system. Uh, that would have a really big impact versus um, kind of some of these smaller things where we're thinking about travel expenses or, or th- things that are just frankly a little bit more finite. Mm-hmm. Shereen, I love that you mentioned uh, that Salt Lake County is a county of the first class, which of course refers to its population size, but it has this preeminent role as um, the capital county. And you know, almost. I thought, I thought that was Utah County. <laughs> it's not. I or, mean, almost or is that Cash splash, John. <laughs> it's, it's still not. by far the largest county, and uh, particularly when it comes to jobs and the size of the economy. But I would just this comment that when Salt Lake County sneezes, other counties catch a cold. Uh, If you're in Cache County, if you're in Box Elder County, if you're in any of the other urban counties, when you see this kind of budget thing happening in Salt Lake County, it means it's not far off for you. So just a a word to the wise. John? But Shireen, I think 36% of the state lives in Salt Lake County. Yeah. So even more than you thought. (laughs) Hey, John, um, we need to talk about this ex-Juab County clerk who uh, faces charges She's accused of shredding election ballots. Um, This is a woman who was charged in 4th District Court with willful neglect of duty. Former former county clerk auditor down there. Mm -hmm. She's no longer in office. She she had left office uh, a while back. But my understanding there is, is there's no allegations that the outcome of the election was changed or altered. But after the votes were counted, she prematurely disposed of ballots that were supposed to be retained for almost two years and she shredded them or something like this. I also believe there was some improper storage. The way that they were stored was also concerning. I I guess I would just say this. I think in a small county, um, little mistakes like this can mean a lot. Uh, I think especially for me on the left, I feel like I consistently hear about um, you know, ballot tampering or, you know, concerns related to elections to see that the, that it is actually, um, that when there is misconduct, that it has, you know, sometimes tends to happen on the right is concerning for me. Um, I also think that people really do want a system where they know that their vote is private and that it's protected. And I'm, I'm glad to see that this was brought to light. And I hope that Juab County is moving forward in a way that ensures that people know that their ballot is going to be safe and it's going to be uh, addressed properly through the system and laws that we have. Mm-hmm. Well, and properly counted and properly stored and properly audited and all that stuff. Correct. Yeah. Yep. And and let our legal systems go to work to correct any problems. Hey, uh, Shireen, uh, since you're a Salt Lake uh, City resident, uh, the Rocky Anderson Mayor Mendenhall uh, race, uh, I don't know anything about what the polls are saying. I know it's ranked choice voting. Uh, my sense is that Mayor Mendenhall is, is leading here. But uh, what would you share with our listeners? And then let's let John give his two bits. Yeah, so it, most of us have a municipal election um, across this entire state. So I want to make sure that people know that you do have extra time to vote. When you hear this, we'll have already had election day across the country, but not in Utah. We are delaying because of a special election in the second congressional district. And I would just say that if you are in a community that has ranked choice voting, what you have the opportunity to do is to pick your first choice, your second, and then in our case, we have three candidates running for mayor, Michael Ballantyne being the other. You are welcome to rank all three of those in the order of your preference. And what that means then is if somebody gets a clear majority coming out of the gate, they win that election. If not, then it goes to the second choice. And so then you get to see sort of a redistribution or a a distribution that accounts for how people rated their second choice candidate. And that helps to determine who is then ultimately going to move into first place. I think it's good for us to utilize this system. Um, We've got a lot of great candidates out there. I just want to express my gratitude to everybody who jumped in a municipal race. Really important work happens at the city level. Yeah. John? So it's a little different where I live. We've got three people on the ballot for three seats. And though, so we also have three people running as write-in candidates. So we have a little different dynamic down in Highland, Utah, where I live. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, both sides of the aisle has been statewide today, uh, sharing uh, thoughts all around the state. And I'll just say that people, you have your ballots, um, mail them in, fill them out. Let's get our voter participation up. We really need it. Uh, John, from the state auditor's perspective, how important are elections? Uh, elections have consequences. <laughs> and Shireen? I couldn't agree more. Yeah, time to place your vote. Well, it's been a great program. So grateful to my co-hosts, uh, John Dougal and Shireen Gurbani. Program is produced by Anthony Scoma. Thanks, everybody, for listening.